uh, today's seminar with Donna, uh, il hashtag Ilta Talks uh, or uh, at, uh, handle uh, at Ilta Tweets and obviously Donna's own at Donna Lancro. Um, and I'm just going to introduce Donna then before she kicks off. So just very briefly, uh, Donna is an anthropologist and a, and a folklorist, which uh, put her very well at home here in Ireland, I think. Um, she's born in the desert. Uh, she has no time for, for BS. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that. Um, Are we not swearing? Is that, <laughs> is that a warning? <laughs> okay. Donna has no time for bullshit. Um, yeah. in, a, in addition to research and writing, uh, Donna conducts workshops, facilitates discussions, gives talks, and participates in panel discussions on topics that she finds interesting um, and won't venture anywhere that's not of interest to her. Um, and the title of today's talk is Torfarig Orum. Um, and Donna, I will hand over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Gavin. Um, it's it's really nice to see everybody here. Um, I see that Gavin has highlighted my video and I'm gonna encourage people to go into gallery mode because you don't really need to see, I'm not doing slides, I'm not doing anything. And it's just sort of nice to see the, the span of, of names and faces. Um, before I talk about my feelings, um, I want to talk about uh, who I am and where I am a little bit first. Um, so where I am is uh, now called Charlotte, North Carolina, but it's uh, Catawba and Cherokee unceded land. Um, I am a Cajun woman. My people are a settler people who uh, settled in the uh, ancestral lands of the Chitimacha people. And I just want to acknowledge that. Um, a little bit more on who I am. Uh, the writer John Scalzi would call the category of person that I am uh, playing in easy mode. So I am a white uh, cisgendered uh, woman and the only easier mode that you can play on, uh, certainly in my country, is a white cisgender man. So uh, the example that, that I often give to my kids when I talk about what kind of privilege we embody in this country is that um, when I get pulled over for speeding, uh, and now that I am 50 years old, that has happened to me four times, three times in the state of California and one time in the state of Virginia. So um, when that has happened, I, I occasionally get a ticket, um, but I don't fear for my life. And sometimes I get a warning. I think the last time I got a warning, he actually called me little lady. So, um, so that, that's who I am. Um, I am also two generations away from sharecroppers. So my Cajun family um, Louisiana French farmed land that not only was not theirs because it was actually the Chitimacha peoples, but they never owned their land. Um, so my father being in the U.S. Air Force and us being white um, means that this house that I live in now, we could buy. So my position has allowed me um, to be in this place where I can safely shelter from this current pandemic storm. So I wanted to also share, so I'm gonna put links in the chat. Um, and if I mess it up, Gavin also has the links. So I'm, I hope that you can see at least the front page of the Charlotte Observer when Tom gave the seminar last month, he, he talked about the numbers of people who had died. Um, and so the front page of our local paper gives the numbers every day. Um, and now they've added the number of people who have been vaccinated against COVID. But in North Carolina alone, we've had 9,841 people die. That's just in my state. The national number of deaths right now is 486,332. So 
in 2016, after the election, I and a lot of people I knew were sick and scared and angry about what would happen. My daughter uh, couldn't even go to school the next day. I think we kept her home for a couple of days. Um, and I was very late to the first person experience of knowing that there was going to be a government happy for me and the people in my family to be dead. Because Black Americans have lived with that since 1619. There has never been a time in American history where the American government wasn't happy for Black people to die if it was to the benefit of white Americans. So the fact that it took me until 2016 to feel that sick and scared and angry is a problem. And it's my responsibility to not wait until I feel it personally um, before I think that something should be done about it. I should say something about why the title is the title and why people like Laurie are teasing me about um, subtitles. Uh, why do I have a couple of in Goga? I lived in Cork uh, as an undergraduate for a year. And I used to speak and understand it pretty well. Um, and I, it is now sadly very much atrophied, my Irish. Um, so treat me like an Irish politician who starts off with a sentence or two um, and ask me questions in English. Um, and Garod O'Sullivan, um, can attest that my comprehension is woefully low these days. He tested me not long ago and I was very disappointing. <laughs> but, uh, but ta, ta fadigorum, uh, maybe orin, uh, maybe all of us should be angry and remember this anger. Um, because if we forget, um, I think we will be too quick to find comfort in the things that we wish were the case. And I think that the move to comfort is a really powerful one and it's an understandable one. Um, but it means that we're not gonna fight hard enough to change what needs to change. So what are the things that I am angry about? So I'm angry at government failures killing people. That's our baseline right now. Um, and I read out the numbers from, from the paper. But I, I think that um, Every time we talk about what's happening now or how we're doing um, or, or anything that we're trying to sort of gauge how things are going, we need to append in a pandemic, in a pandemic emergency, in, in, a, in a context of, of so many deaths that should have been and could have been prevented. That 486,000 number, 450,000 of those deaths occurred under the previous administration. And uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that all of those people should still be here. The related thing that I'm angry about is people being more concerned about money than other people. And capitalism has not left us during the pandemic. Um, there's an awful lot of what's in the pandemic for me going around. How can I leverage that going forward? Um, you could see literal profiteering on that. You could see it in um, people trying to exploit the labor of uh, delivery workers, of grocery store workers, um, the fact that the billionaires that we have in our country have become even more wealthy um, is an indictment of many things, um, but it is, is definitely evidence that the wrong people are continuing to uh, benefit from uh, tragedy. I see it in universities in uh, kind of an ed tech triumphalism. They're finally listening to us about digital. 
we finally have them listening to us. And I have intense sympathy for people who have not been listened to for a long time. And I think there should have been a lot more listening to people who know what they're talking about around uh, digital tools and places and, and the role that they have to play in the current educational landscape. And still, this is not the time for people to say, this is my chance for people to listen to me. So I'm teaching anthropology right now to undergraduate and postgraduate students here at UNC Charlotte. And one of the things that I keep saying to them is uh, motivations matter. So it's not enough for you to say, I'm gonna go do anthropology, I'm gonna study this thing. You have to ask the question, for whom are you doing this? Now, are you doing it for you? Are you doing it so that people will pay attention to you the anthropologist, are you going to be the star of the show? Because your motivation should be that you're going to learn something from the people who are willing to teach you. And that will be of benefit to the people who are willing to teach you. So I think that motivations matter um, in, uh, in universities. I think they matter in the work of instructional design and educational technology. I think they matter in libraries. I think that when people in libraries and ed tech and ID say, um, this is gonna be great, we need to ask the question for who? For who is this great? Is it great for your division in the university because now you finally have a seat at the table? Or is it gonna be good for the people at the university who need your help? Because people, I think, at almost all levels have been reduced to survival. How am I going to get through this is something that um, people keep asking themselves. How, how do I get to tomorrow? How do I wake up this morning? Um, and those of us who have the privilege of being able to, to work from home are still getting by day by day. So, so we could definitely say things like, it could be worse, right? I could have fewer choices. I could have to leave the house. I could have to go work in a situation where I, I can't be protected. Um, but this survival mode that we've collectively been in now since March of last year, um, is the context in which people are now being asked to be creative, which is something that I find terrifying and, uh, and difficult to witness. Um, I have seen far too many thriving in the pandemic narratives. The idea that you could be winning in a pandemic situation. I've finally figured out how to hack my life so that it's, it's even better than it was before. Um, and I certainly don't think that people should be asked to be creative at work at this moment when we're just trying to get by. We're just trying to get people through and out of the emergency. And, um, and, I, and I get so angry <laughs> when I see the, you know, how are you managing to be creative in the pandemic? I just, I just want that to stop because everything is hard everything, going for a walk, cleaning the kitchen, reading a book, it's, it's all hard. I think the other thing that I get angry about are the silences. And the silences that don't get listened to enough. People have disappeared, people have died. So some of the research that I managed to do this past year, um, I did with, with Laurie Phipps at JISC and with uh, Garode and Tom uh, in uh, Cork and Kerry. We talked to people um, who we could talk to. We wanted to, we originally planned projects to learn about academic practice 
not anticipating the pandemic um, and ended up doing a project about academic practice during the pandemic. What does it look like to teach your classes? What does it look like um, to be in touch with your students? And the fact was we talked to the people we could talk to. We talked to the people who answered us when we said, hey, would you be willing to, to talk to us? Um, and we did learn things. We especially learned about how the human relationships they have with each other um, and with their students have an impact on their experiences of, of teaching and learning. And um, some of the, the most powerful narratives were, were about the ways that people who had strong, trusted relationships with colleagues um, and with other parts of the university felt that they had license to try things that they weren't sure if they would work. So uh, in this context where everything had to suddenly be digital, people who weren't necessarily tremendously confident because they'd never done anything like that before, nonetheless went ahead and tried it because they, they knew that their colleagues trusted them and they trusted their colleagues to help them with the stuff that didn't work out right. And that's not a digital capabilities thing. That's not a skills thing. That's a being embedded in a context where you have the, the power to um, try things that might not work and, and you won't be punished for the things that don't work. Um, yes, to Lori's point that some people talk to us because they hadn't had a chance to talk to other people. We 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 talked to, to one academic who I think he said we were the first people that he had spoken to um, with voices in two or three months. And all of the rest of his uh, conversations had been over email. So I think that what was important for us to realize was that even as we were learning from the people who we talked to, it was not possible for us to learn from the people who could not talk to us. We could not learn from the people who couldn't talk to us because they had childcare obligations. We could not talk to the people who could not connect with us because they had bandwidth issues. Um, I remember interviewing uh, one of the academics in Ireland who said that if he lived across the road from where his house is now, he would not have been able to have a conversation with me on Skype because the bandwidth wouldn't have extended that far. So there are, there are physical contexts uh, that restrict people uh, being in touch with us. There are, are life circumstance contexts. And we have a responsibility to respond to those silences at least as strongly as we respond to the voices that we are capable of hearing and collecting. And I think that's our responsibility as researchers. And it's also our responsibility um, as practitioners. Who are we not hearing from and not assume that no news is good news? We need to assume that no news means we have work to do. And it's work that we always should have been doing. I think that the other thing is it's, it's not new that this responsibility is here, but it is, it is sort of newly evident. Um, I will say that this particular move, um, I'm putting the link in here, no mass return of students to third level campuses before the summer in Ireland gives me some hope um, that people are paying attention to the important things. <laughs> and maybe the important thing right now is not a mass move of people back to campuses, um, which is certainly the trajectory that we're seeing here in the US. Uh, we're being told that everything's gonna be back to normal by fall. So that's a real problem for those of us who would like to see other people get vaccinated before uh, staff and faculty at universities Right? We would like to see the housekeeping staff get vaccinated first. We would like to see uh, the food services people get vaccinated first. We would like to see anybody who's already working in the buildings of the universities get vaccinated before teaching faculty because we have the option now of teaching from home. 
But the rhetoric of the legislatures in places like North Carolina and across the U.S. is that they want faculty to be back in the buildings too. So if we want to be safe, we're probably going to have to insist on vac being vaccinated probably sooner than we should be. And so all of those privileges that have already accrued to us are just going to be amplified. And I think that's what anger does. And I, I need to remember that. I need to remember how exhausting it is to be angry. Um, I need to learn more from activists and from people who've been doing advocacy work in justice movements for much longer than I have been doing any single thing. Um, that anger can't be my only motivation uh, because it will eat me alive. And uh, I'm linking to a Twitter thread that reminded me of this um, from a woman who is a union organizer. And she said, when I was a union organizer, I was, I was taught that anger moves people to action and that action is what can topple oppressive powers. And she's speaking specifically about mutual aid. She says, mutual aid is teaching me that care for others also moves people to action and challenges systems by daring them to provide for our people as we provide for them now. And in the moment when I came across that tweet, it was really powerful for me because I'm hollowed out in so many ways by feeling angry. And, and that does inspire me to action. I wrote so many letters to voters last year. I wrote so many emails to my congressional representatives. I made phone calls. Um, I marched, uh, I did all of the things out of a sense of anger of what had been happening for the last four years and, and before then, um, and the things that didn't need to happen that were killing people. And got to that point where everything is hard. So... I think we need to ask, how do we use what has happened to build things that are not terrible? Not a, how do we bright side this situation, right? But, but what can we pick up um, and use to, to change things? How do we keep the human parts of what is getting us through? Um, we need to engage in collective action. We need to continue to, to organize our labor. Um, the US has a terrible problem with labor policies and a lack of strong union representation, especially in higher education labor. Um, I live in what we call a right to work state, which um, paradoxically means that it's, it's more difficult to join a union or to have union representation of workers. Um, we need to continue to engage in political action and advocacy and remember in particular that there are people already doing the work who need help and not imagine that we need to invent new work to be done, but that we need to identify the people who are already doing the advocacy work um, and, lend, and lend our help. Um, another thing that came across that was very helpful for me in thinking was this article. I'm going to put the link in the chat. So I follow uh, people who write about uh, children's literature on Twitter. And this article came across uh, my Twitter feed, Reading Relational in Mildred D. Taylor towards a black feminist care ethics for children's literature. And I recommend the article just because it's a really good read. Um, but the theoretical framing is what drew me to, to this article. Um, and in particular, black feminist ethics of care. Um, 
there is a history uh, in uh, feminist scholarship about this ethics of care, talking about um, the relationships that you have to have and the ways that care is enacted um, as a feminist practice. Black feminist ethics of care talk about relationships and care, but also pay attention to power and emphasizes both the relational and the contextual. So not just who is in the relationship, but what kind of power these people have uh, in relation to each other. So it made me think about the responses to this pandemic emergency where relationships are being built and are being relied on, um, but where interventions, um, things like self-care and mindfulness webinars, for instance, uh, are being offered in the absence of care, in a vacuum of relationships. And what Black feminist ethics of care teaches us is that you have to finish that loop. The act of care has to be acknowledged as such by the person or the group of people who are ostensibly being cared for. So an intervention that is sold as care without being experienced as caring is not ethical. And it's not actually care. Um, and on page 16 of this article, the author says, um, not all care is attuned to the power discrepancies inherent to reading or relating to others. So I think what I would like to see is more questioning about who certain actions are caring for or if they are acts of care at all. And if the people at whom these things are pointed um, experience these things as, as care. If we ask that question about things such as online proctoring or surveillance via data collection and learning analytics, I think we discover more about the priorities of the institution in terms of its own preservation uh, more than care for students or staff. Even if the rhetoric around those interventions is often about care. In practice, we can see that that is not the case. And the frame of uh, Black feminist ethics of care can help us get to that point. Um, I know that it is also true that uh, disability scholars have written an awful lot about the need to pay attention to power um, and rhetoric of care. Um, and I follow a, a few um, disability scholars and activists on Twitter too, and one of them just in the last couple of weeks reminded me of the phrase, um, oh, now I'm gonna forget the phrase. Um, something along the lines of not for us without us or not about us without us, right? So don't tell me you're doing this for me if you haven't talked to me about what I actually need. Um, and so I think that we can, can take those framings from people who have a lot to say about what they actually need and have been talking about it for a while. The, the justified righteous anger from disability activists and scholars who look around now at how possible it is to do things online, how possible it is to make things um, more accessible when nobody can get to physical places. And they say things like, I was asking for this 10 years ago. And then when everybody needed it, you provided it in a week. So we have collectively revealed ourselves to be unwilling to do the things that people have been asking for for a very long time. So I would like for us to remember that we should have been doing these things all along even when we get to a point where it doesn't have to be the only way that we move through the world. So I would like for our priorities, the priorities that we experience in institutional contexts, in educational contexts, just in the world, to no longer make us so angry or tired. Um, I think it'd be really nice to have an institution filled with trusted relationships. Um, 
And I think that's, that's where I'll stop. How is everybody doing? <laughs> Let's talk about how people are doing. <laughs>